Our dear viewers and listeners, we we'll greet you all in the precious and wonderful name of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. This is the day the Lord has made, and we shall rejoice and be glad in it. Once again, we welcome you to today's Bible study, which comes to you from Dominion Church International. I request you to invite somebody to join us today. Because it is going to be wonderful in the presence of God. Before we begin today's session, let's take a moment to dedicate it to God in prayer. Let's pray. Oh Lord, we thank you. Yes, Lord. What an amazing Savior. Mm -hmm. Amazing God you are to us. Yes, Lord. Our Prince of Peace, mm -hmm. our Comforter, mm -hmm. our Everlasting Father. Yes, Lord. Lord, today we praise your name. Mm -hmm. Today we choose to magnify you above all the circumstances. Yes, Lord. Thank you for the gift of salvation. Mm -hmm. Thank you for making us the temples of the Holy Spirit. Mm -hmm. Thank you for the gift of your word. Mm -hmm. That even as it comes to us today, Mm -hmm. Let it change hearts. Let it revive those that are called. Let it reveal Jesus to us, King yes, of Lord. Glory. That at the end of it all, King of Glory, no man will take the glory, mm -hmm. but only you alone, mm -hmm. in Jesus' name. Amen. 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 We are taking today's reading from the book of Romans chapter 5 from verse 18 to verse 21. The Bible says, Therefore, as through one man's offense, judgment came to all men, resulting in condemnation. Even so, through one man's righteous act, the free gift came to all men, resulting in justification of life. For as by one man's disobedience, many were made sinners, so also by one man's obedience, many will be made righteous. Moreover, the law entered that the offense may abound, but where sin abounded, grace abounded much more. So that as sin reigned in death, even so grace may reign through righteousness to eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. These are the last four verses in the book of Romans chapter 5. And it brings to conclusion the massive section on justification by faith alone through Jesus Christ alone. That we began in Romans chapter 3 verse 21. So what has happened? For two and a half Chapters. Paul labored to bring to our attention this important doctrine of justification by faith in Jesus Christ. And it was quite a journey where he was like a lawyer. 
He did bring to us witnesses. Two witnesses from the Old Testament. To bring the point to us. That justification by faith. Is not just a New Testament theology. It goes all the way to the Old Testament. So he brought to us Abraham, who was the first witness that we are justified by faith. And he brought to us David as a witness as well. And both of these testified that justification is by faith alone apart from works. So he used various ways of arguing this out. And then he took us to the benefits of justification. And then he begins to paint the picture of how God looks at humanity in groups of two persons. One, the first Adam. And the last one is the one we call the last Adam, Jesus Christ. So now, having done all that, he comes to verse 18. And he says, therefore, through one man's offense, and the one man here is Adam. He says judgment came to all men, resulting in condemnation. And he goes on to add by drawing a parallel and says, even so, through one's, one man's righteous act, the free gift came to all men, resulting in justification of life. He goes on to say, for us by one man's disobedience. Many became sinners. Also by one man's obedience. Many will be made righteous. These are wonderful thoughts that come to us. And we will unpack it in three sections so that we are able to break it down and understand it. In verse 18, Paul brings to us the summation of what he has been deliberating on all the way from verse 12 to verse 17. Now, in verse 19, he provides for us the explanation why he has concluded that way. And then in verse 20 to 21, he draws the grand conclusion of everything he began to talk about from Romans chapter 3 verse 21 all the way to Romans chapter 5 verse 19. And this is a wonderful argument he brings out. Let's begin with verse 18. He begins by saying, therefore. So he is coming to the conclusion of the matter. And he says, this is how it ends. Through one man's 
offense. Judgment came to all men. And this judgment resulted into condemnation. Some versions use offense and some versions use transgression. But that is the Greek word paraptoma. Now, paraptoma means to deviate, to get off course. So, it means to take a false step, to get into the wrong direction. Or what we mean to go astray. So, what does this mean? When we go back to Genesis chapter 3, when man sinned in the Garden of Aden, and this whole argument I will re-emphasize, presupposes that Adam did live historically. He was not just a mythical figure. He was not an imaginary person. Adam lived in history. In the same way that Jesus lived in history. When you take that argument out, everything else collapses. So it actually becomes a blasphemy. But what we need to ascertain, what we need to be assured of, that Adam did live as a person. And so the Bible says, therefore, as through one man's offense. Basically, what he means is that when Adam took the fruit, of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. I, I know many of us have grown up and we've been taught it was an apple tree. The Bible does not say that. It says it was a fruit from the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. God had given a very clear instruction and given Adam the opportunity to eat of every tree in the garden except this one. So, when Adam decided to eat of this one, based on what the devil had told him, you see, the devil came and told him, you know, God is not that good to you. God is holding something from you. And there we see a sequence of actions on the side of Adam, which sequence is brought to us by 1 John chapter 2, verse 15 to 16. That happens to all men that draws them to sin, that draws them to disobey God's command, which includes the last of the flesh, which includes the last of the eyes, and the boastful pride of life. For the Bible says he saw and then he perceived that it was desirable. He desired it in his heart. And based on that, he, he perceived that this was, would bring knowledge to him. 
Na ulirali chino chigenda muongero kumanya. And therefore he flagrantly defiantly disobeyed God. Au, na achikola anga agende lende okujemela. God had told him the day you eat of this you shall die. Katona ali ya muka kasa, orunako roli guli yako toli de makufa. There was already judgment. Based on this action. So when he ate, this judgment came to him. But not just him. The Bible says it came to all men. And the result of this judgment was condemnation condemnation to all humanity. So basically, Adam's sin was charged to the account of every man that would come out of his loin. And every man, I mean every human being that would come out of his loins. That's why the Bible says in Romans chapter 5 and verse 12 that just as through one man sin entered into the world, and death through sin. And so death spread to all men. Because all men sin. So what happened? God imputed sin to all men. This was an act that happened immediately. It happened vicariously. And it all happened at once. So what happened thousands of years ago is credited to your account and my account. Before we were even conceived, before we ever committed any individual act of sin. We were already sinners. So this indicates how holy God is. You, you see, you don't have to commit many sins to be a sinner. Just one sin before a holy God. That is enough to bring condemnation. And may I add that this condemnation is not temporal. This is an eternal condemnation. Because we are under an eternal judgment. So there is nothing that a condemned person would do that would outweigh, that would somehow outweigh what they had done. So what the Bible brings to us is that Adam was a representative of humanity before God. And whatever Adam did affected the entire human race. So the problems that we have are all pointed back to this origin. To what Adam did. And so the Bible goes on to tell us and brings now the good news in the second part of verse 18. It says, even so, or we'll put it another, it says, in a like manner. Even so, through one man's righteous act, the free gift came to all men, resulting in justification of life. 
So who is this one man they are talking about? This is Jesus Christ. So what did he accomplish by his righteousness? So by this act of righteousness, this act impacted all men and resulted into God justifying men. So what is happening here? So all men, and I need to point out, when they talk about him justifying all men, it does not mean that all men that sinned under Adam and were condemned. So it does not impute all men at birth. No. All of us are imputed through birth. So what that means this it is those that have experienced the second birth. Those that are the elect of God. Those that are born again. It is those that receive this justification of life. And I want you to understand that. So, Adam. Adam. The old man for Adam refers to everyone. The, the old man with respect to Jesus Christ refers to all those he came to save. Those whom he died for on the cross. So it refers to a specific group of people. Out of Adam's foreign race. Those who have believed in him. Those who have exercised personal faith in Jesus Christ. It is those whom Paul later tells us in chapter 8 and chapter 9. Those are the ones he calls those that he foreknew. And he predestined. And he called. And he justified. And he glorified. Romans 8, 29 to 30. So what we see here are two doctrines. One is the doctrine of sovereign election. And divine election. So you need to understand that. And later in the scriptures we see this. Back in the Bible, even with Esau and Jacob, God clearly says, Jacob I loved, Esau I hated. And we see that in as we go along, it refers to men that God has elected, the elect of God, who in eternity past, God sent his son to die for them. So, those that he knew, and he called, out of the race of Adam, are the ones that we now he justifies. So what is the point? We know that now the entire world is found in one of these two. Either Jesus Christ 
or Adam. And now the action of each of them impacts those that belong to that group. Basically, that is the summary. Which brings us to verse 19, where he explains what he stated in verse 18. And he says, For as by one man's disobedience, many were made sinners. So also, one, by one man's obedience, many will be made righteous. He doesn't say many were made. Many will be. They have to believe to become. So, for by one man's disobedience, so Adam's offense, which was willful, which was volition, which was a choice of his will against what God had decreed in Genesis 2.17. The Bible says many were made sinners. And the many here refers to all men. So all of us in the eyes of God, became sinners. But the good news is this. <laughs> there, he says through the obedience of one, many will be made righteous. What is he doing here? He shows one obeying where the other disobeyed. Now, he's introducing a very important truth here regarding the obedience of our Lord Jesus Christ. And the obedience of our Lord Jesus Christ is in two respects. And we need to understand these two respects. The first one is the active obedience through his sinless life in perfect obedience to the law of God, to the will of God for his life throughout his entire life on earth. So where Adam broke God's law, Jesus succeeded in keeping God's law to the dot. And why is that important? That is why he had to become a man. That is why incarnation is important. So he had to come in the flesh. Like Galatians chapter 4 from verse 4 to 5 tells us. To be born under the law and keep this law, then he may redeem those who were born under the law. And that, those are you and I. So to be born under the law, or to be under the law means to be accountable directly to the law. And so what that meant, he had to be, there was a level of responsibility upon him to fulfill every requirement of the law. And this perfect obedience 
then purchases what we call the perfect righteousness. Which God then imputes to us when we place our faith in him and his finished work. So, having understood that, that is the first aspect. Then there is the other aspect of obedience, which theologians call the passive. Now, this passive obedience does not mean that he was, he did nothing. No, in this passive obedience, this is where he gave himself. So what this means, he submitted himself to the cross. He laid down his life. No one took it. He laid it down. And laying or giving his life freely for us. He shed his blood. Becoming the Lamb of God to take away our sins. The Apostle Peter puts it so well when he says he bore our sins in his body on a tree. First Peter chapter 2, verse 24. And John tells us he, that he became that scapegoat that carries away our sins. Remember in John chapter 1 verse 29 when John the Baptist saw him he says behold the Lamb of God who takes away the sins of the world. This one is God's Lamb. He is the one that God has chosen. The one that God has set apart for the purpose of taking away like the scapegoat took away the sins from the population of Israel. Jesus Christ takes away the sins of those that believe him. And that truth is so fundamental. Because when we believe in him, when we trust in him. Our sins cannot remain with us. He is God's lamb. He's God's chosen lamb to take away our sins. He takes them away from us. So his blood was shed to wash away our sins. And when we confess our sins, First John 1 9 tells us that he's faithful and just to forgive us and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. So his entire life, and this I'm referring to Jesus. Yes. His entire life was a life of obedience. And when he shed his blood, when he gave his life, it is that blood that washes us. You see, the, when you read the Bible, you find some very amazing truth. There are several times when the blood came out of Jesus. But that is not what we are talking about. As a Jew, he had to be circumcised. 
And that meant blood was shed. But that's not the blood that redeems. In the garden, he, he, he sweated. And the drops of sweat appeared as blood. That is not the blood that saves. The blood that cleanses is the blood that was shed at Calvary. So his entire life was lived for a purpose. His entire life was a life of obedience. And it is that obedience that makes us righteous. So as many as come to him, out of every kindred, out of every tribe, out of every tongue, as many as believed him, it is those that are made the righteousness of God. Then Paul, after having concluded that, he goes to verse 20 to 21. Now you may say, but I think the matter is now concluded. There is no other argument. Yes. In a certain sense, it is. When you are looking at it from verse 12 to verse 17, but I told you this goes far back to chapter 3, verse 21. Look at what he says in 3.21. He says, now apart from the law, the righteousness of God has been made manifest. Now, apart from the law, the righteousness of God has been made manifest. Now, look at what is happening. In verse 19, he talks about the righteousness. He talks about men being made righteous. But he wants to drive it home. That this righteousness is apart from the law. So what has the law got to do with this? He then comes to verse 20 to explain what role the law played in all this and how this righteousness that is apart from the law that we gain through Jesus' obedience and comes to all men who believe in him. So in verse 20 he says, moreover over. The law entered that the offense may abound. But where sin abounded, grace abounded much more. So what is he trying to say? So he's trying to tell us and let me say what he's not trying to say. It does not mean, look when he says the law came in, so that the offense would increase, or so that the transgression would increase. He does not mean that God gave the law so that there would be more sin in the world. No. The implication of saying that the law came in so that sin may increase or, or so that there would be more sin would try in a way imply that it is God who is the author of sin. Yet the scripture is very clear that God is not the author of sin. So the law came in 
to heighten the sense of awareness of sin. So the law brings the knowledge of sin. It provokes our understanding to the fact that sin exists. And why is that important? Because then that, that draws us to a savior. You see, no one is saved until they know that they are lost. Let me draw the analogy. You see, you do not go to the doctor until you suspect that there is something wrong. So when you go to the doctor, the doctor will ask you, how are you feeling? And then you begin to explain, I have this. Then you ask, okay, do you have any pain here? Uh, how long has this taken? So after this, long dialogue with the doctor. They then bring, do, do a number of checks and bring to you the awareness of the magnitude of the problem that you have. So it is in the same vein that we understand what the law was all about. You see, when you have little knowledge of sin, you would think you can overcome it. You might think, oh no, God cannot be bothered with this. You know, no, I can do a lot of good that will definitely balance out. But when you understand the magnitude of sin that is standing between you and God, then you realize you need a savior. Then you realize you need to be justified. And this justification is by faith. You realize your need to be declared righteous. And there is only one who can make you righteous. The one who obeyed the law met all the requirements of the law. It is his righteousness that will be credited to you that will bring you into right standing with God. And that is why the law is important. It is our tool for evangelism. It is our partner to try and help us to reach people. And therefore be able to provide to them the saving remedy of Jesus Christ. You see, there is this story in the Bible. It is, I think, in Matthew chapter 19 of this rich young man who comes to Jesus and says, what must I do to get saved? In other words, what must I do to receive eternal life? And Jesus looks at him. And then Jesus quotes for him what he requires to do. He looks at the entire law. And he picks the second part of the law. And he says, do this. And the young man says, I have done that since I was young. Then Jesus tells him, you go sell everything and come and follow me. Basically, he's taking him to the first part of the law. Which is that you shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your soul with all your strength. And the young man walked away. You see, it is not wrong to have possessions. But when possessions take hold of your life, and you live for the possessions, 
Then you get off track. So Jesus uses the law to drive points across the point that it is God first. And when you miss that, you miss something very important. So in a nutshell, what am I saying? What does the law do for us? The law defines for us what sin is. The law reveals to us what sin is. It exposes the power of sin. It unveils to us the deceit of sin. So the law is like getting sin and bringing it under a microscope. And this time it focuses on our hearts. So what appears so small then gains significance. You realize that this is huge upon my heart. And then you take this burden and take it to the cross. Why? Because it pronounces the curse. It, it tells you that if you keep this with you, it will lead to death. Because this is the penalty for breaking the law. Basically, the law is contained in the law itself. So, and it brings you to that need to be saved. So, the Bible tells us, moreover, the law entered that the offense may abound. So that it may show you how big sin is how big the transgression or the offense is. But he says where sin abounded. Grace abounded much more. And this is great news. Hallelujah. You see what this means is that your sin is great. Yes. But the grace of God is much greater. Bringing it back to the two persons that we saw, it tells you that we gain more from Jesus Christ than what we lost in Adam. We gain more by grace than what we lost by sin. Now, when you understand that, it brings us to verse 21, where he now draws back and brings us to two kingdoms and two kings. And he says, so that as death reigned, as sin reigned in death, even so, grace might reign through righteousness to eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. What is he trying to see here. He's trying to tell us that there are two kingdoms. Two kings. And every one of us is one in one or the other. There is a kingdom in which death reigns. And all there is a kingdom. Let me put it correctly. There is a kingdom in which sin reigns. And because sin reigns, sin reigns through death. 
And this death is physical. It is spiritual. And it is eternal. So, when you belong to this one, you will have the physical death, you have the spiritual death, and you have the eternal death. So, death reigns in sin. That means everyone that is born of Adam, everyone that is, comes into this earth, Sin reigns in their life. And therefore death is upon them. But he says, even so, grace will reign through righteousness. So the reign of grace is the antithesis of the reign of sin. So grace then comes out which has your best interests at heart. It reigns over a kingdom of purity and righteousness and love. So as sin reigns and death reigns in one kingdom, Grace and righteousness reigns in the other. And so he winds up and says, so that as sin reigned in death, even so grace may reign through the righteousness to life. And this is eternal life through Jesus Christ, our Lord. And here he uses all the names of Jesus. Jesus as the one who saves. Christ as the anointed one. And Lord, which is the Greek word kurios, which means the sovereign one, the one who rules and super rules over everything. So this is what Peter talked about to everyone that is listening to me. The apostle Peter, in chapter 4 and verse 12, has this submission and says there is therefore salvation in no one else. For there is no other name given under heaven that has been given among men by which we must be saved. There is only one name only one escape route. This name is Jesus Christ. So today I'm speaking to you, watching us or listening to us. In which kingdom are you seated? In which kingdom are you now? The one of Adam or the one of Jesus Christ. The one where sin reigns unto death or the one where grace reigns unto righteousness. The good news is there is an escape from the kingdom of sin. The escape is through Jesus Christ. Today, you can surrender your life to Jesus. Believe his finished work by faith. And you will cross over from the kingdom where sin reigns to the kingdom where grace reigns. Why don't you say this prayer with me? Save God of heaven the creator of the universe. I thank you for the gift 
Jesus Christ, the Savior of the world. I believe that he came to redeem mankind. And today, I place my faith in him and his finished work on my behalf. Today I claim that righteousness by faith. Lord, forgive my sins. Cleanse me. I thank you because you have saved me. Thank you, Lord, for saving me. Amen. If you say that prayer from the bottom of your heart, you have been wonderfully saved. You have crossed over from death to life, from sin to grace, from death to righteousness. You are now in the kingdom where love reigns. You are now in the kingdom of the second Adam. And that is great news. You have crossed over from life to death. There is that number on the screen. Please call it. Someone will give you the first instruction on this wonderful journey. For those of you who are born again, this is the foundation of what we believe. There is no other name given among men by which we must be saved. There is only one name. There is only one person. He alone is the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father except through Him. It is Jesus Christ, the Savior of the world. Thank you for watching us. It's been a pleasure having you today. And from Dominion Church, we we'll pray the grace of God upon your life. Till we meet again. Shalom.